All right, this is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. This is KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM, and I'm Jess Khanam. And this is Jamal Dejani. So we're, uh, this is a new format that we're trying right now, Jamal, and we want to welcome our listeners both uh, on Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as KPOO um, in San Francisco, 89.5 FM. And um, we have a lot to cover today, Jamal, because there's been a lot of really interesting news that has come out lately about the Khashoggi uh, murder. And just to put it in context, as you know, we've covered this for weeks and weeks now. And I think in many ways, we've been ahead of the curve. But what came out recently was um, a couple of things, kind of a softened, what I believe was a fake admission by the Saudi uh, government and their PR division. Well, there was a denial initially. Initially the denial. And then they came out with something that was relatively correct. Then they walked that back. And then um, more recently, they have put out um, the so-called um, results of their investigation, which was weak in many ways, which completely distanced the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman from having anything to do with the brutal murder of Jamal Khashoggi. And then more recently, we had the CIA, you know, this report leaked by the CIA that basically said, unquestionably, undeniably, unequivocally, Mohammed bin Salman not only knew about it, but ordered it. Well, also, we have to also say that this, the leak, of course, and the story coming out from the CIA came after the CIA director, Gina Haspel. Yeah. She went to Turkey, to Istanbul, I guess listened to the tape or maybe even watched a videotape, came back, reported the information to Trump. Trump was asked if you remember if he had listened to the recording and he right. said he didn't need to because basically uh, it's, uh, I don't know the word he used, uh, unpleasant or... Yeah, he basically said it was too unpleasant. Something, yeah. something yeah. people suffering, so I didn't want to listen to it. But I'm sure he received a transcript. Yeah. I mean, in, in any briefing, that's the first thing that uh, they'll do. They'll, they'll give you a transcript. So he listened to uh, Khashoggi pleading for his life and basically uh, breathing his last breath before they murdered him. So uh, Trump didn't want to listen to it. I don't know if he listened to it now. The CIA, basically now the leaks that we have from the CIA, you know, confirms that he was uh, murdered by Mohammed bin Salman's hench henchmen and that he was directly involved. And in fact, but not one just... of them made a phone call to say that right. the mission basically was accomplished. Right, but not just directly involved. I mean, I think what uh, the CIA report is saying, Jamal, is that it goes beyond just that Mohammed bin Salman was directly involved, directly ordered, I think is the conclusion uh, we'll eventually see from the CIA report that this was initially thought of, orchestrated, approved, and carried out with the direct, not just knowledge of Mohammed bin Salman, but the order and the blessing of uh, Mohammed bin Salman. This is really... Um, nothing new to you and I because we've been we've been covering the kind of brutal um, medieval kingdom of Saudi Arabia for for many years now, and for you and I and we we've been speaking about this on Arab Talk for quite some time. The fact that uh, the Saudi government, with the blessing of the Crown Prince, would carry out such a brutal, unmitigated uh, attack on a journalist who living in the United States a permanent resident of the United States and can get away with it is not, it's not new that the Saudi government would do this. I think what's new is the brazenness that they would do this on Turkish soil, that they would do this with a permanent resident of the United States. It's pretty dramatic. Well, also, I mean, the walking back aspect, number one, we know now from directly from the mouth of Donald Trump saying, Listen, oil and our weapon trade and everything else and security basically trumps <laughs> <laughs> a 
everything else and the life of a of a journalist and what Mohammed bin Salman uh, had uh, did had done or didn't do. And then second to that, he says, you know, Saudi Arabia is very important to Israel. <laughs> and without Saudi Arabia, basically Israel will be in trouble. And this is actually a first. Right. Because, you know, we hear it the other way around, that also the Israelis, you know, we know that hold back channels and, and covert and overt meetings between the Saudis and uh, the Israelis and coordination on security and, um, you know, everything basically because Israel, number one now enemy in the region, is uh, Iran, and they have shared common common enemy, you know, and Netanyahu came also to uh, to defend to defend Mohammed Mohammed bin Salman, bin Salman, saying that he should get a pass somehow. That he should get a pass, and Israel, and and, and again, I mean, this is the funny thing: Israel is probably, and the Israeli Mossad is the p- premier assassination agency in the world. In the world. They have assassinated not only Palestinians, but foreign nationals. They've kidnapped Venunu, and now they're keeping him. This is, he's an Israeli citizen who spilled the beans on Israel's nuclear weapons, and they went and kidnapped him, kidnapped him brought him back. Right. Now, after spending many years in jail, he's a prisoner in his own country. He wants to leave. They and won't allow him to leave. So they've done all kinds of things and gotten away with it. And they figured, well, you know, what's the big deal? You know, they and Israel also assassinates and systematically targets journalists and kills journalists all the all time. The, time. the Israeli military has recently shot an Associated Press journalist in the leg. Before that, they've killed one and so on. And they have gotten away with all of this. So why not give MBS a break? You know, it's, after all, he only killed one journalist, and of course he, he has killed more, or Saudi Arabia probably has killed more, but this is the one he got caught right. in the act, basically. But I think that that's kind of the whole point, Jamal, is that what we're seeing is a, it, it, it is a very kind of, um, uh, the, the word to kind of describe this triumvirate of uh, of tyranny, if you will, because we're we're looking at the despotic and tyrannical and oppressive nature of the Israeli government, of the monarchy in Saudi Arabia, and now having the full cover and the blessing of the United States of America and and uh, the president of the United States. It's unbelievably damaging to hear the president of the United States say. You know, this thing, eh, this guy died, he was murdered, it was terrible, but we have arms sales, and it's going to, which we don't have, by the way, uh, they're, not, they're not yet finalized. But we have this incredible trade, we have security with Saudi Arabia, and more importantly, uh, Mohammed bin Salman told me that he had no knowledge of it. So here we again, Jamal, we have the President of the United States not listening to his own intelligence services, not listening to the CIA, not listening to the NSA, not li- listening to his National Security uh, Committee, which has been advising him and basically telling him, Mohammed bin Salman is doing dirty deeds and he murdered Jamal Khashoggi. But you know what? I'm relieved. What I don't do you... want to say I'm happy because I don't want to I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't un... make it sound no, I don't happy. Under, I don't understand what you mean. But relieved. I am relieved. I, I tell you why, because let's drop the pretense mm. that, you know, governments, especially the United States, Saudi Arabia, Israel, care about human rights yeah. and journalism and protecting people. At least this time we know, I mean, you're having the president of the United States, you are having the prime minister of Israel coming out and, and telling you point blank that the strategic relations uh, between us and Saudi Arabia, even though they've murdered their own citizen, even though they've chopped him up to pieces and lied about it and assassinated him on foreign soil in their uh, uh, consulate, it's not important because, after all, it's about strategic relations, it's about trade, it's about oil, it's about weapons. So, so you know... 
this is the thing. I mean, I'd rather hear that instead of having this whole pretense hearing yeah. something from the Secretary of State or whatever. And what we hear on television all the time now that and all this campaign, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm also happy on, on one end that uh, people are keeping the story alive and journalists are talking about it. And they've adopted the, the kind of the, the plight and the sad murder of Jamal Khashoggi uh, because he lived in the Washington, D.C. area, because he worked for the Washington Post, right. because we know hundreds of journalists have disappeared, That's right. have been murdered, have been incarcerated, have been maimed, have been shot at in Palestine, in Egypt, in, in the, Turkey, in, in Turkey, in <laughs> Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Arabia. There are those who, are, who remain nameless. We don't know about them. That's right. They just disappear. Well, and, 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 and this brought it up, you know, out there. But then, so people are not disappointed or not disappointed. So people are not fooled. At least we know now what counts and what doesn't count when it comes no. to international yeah. affairs. I think that's a really excellent point, Jamal, because what this has done is, and if you'll excuse the uh, metaphor that I'm, I'm using, it's kind of lifted the veil, if you will. It has pulled away the curtain. It has really exposed uh, the United States duplicity and the duplicity of not just the United States in creating this fake idea that they are an honest broker and trying to create a peaceful solution to what's, having, uh, what's happening in Palestine and that this, the Saudis want peace in Palestine. All the, It's a complete joke, Jamal. It's a farce. It, it's a complete farce. And so the intimate relations between Mohammed bin Salman and the government of Israel and the duplicitous relationship with the United States, it's good that it's exposed 100%. I mean, we've been saying this for how many years on Arab Talk, right? But the thing that I worry about is that every journalist now in Saudi Arabia, in Palestine, anywhere in the Arab world... Um, is at grave risk, and even the United States for that matter. If yes. you look at what Donald Trump did with Jim Acosta and trying to take away his press pass, we're talking about what this has done is put every single journalist at risk for disappearing and for murder. So it's, it's, it's a very disturbing place that we're at right now because of this. Absolutely, and this is actually we're going to keep following up on this story uh, for a, a long time. But I do, time. I, I do want to say one more thing about this yeah. because I do think it's it's kind of important. One of the things that this points to, Jamal, is that it used to be described that the United States was the big dog on the on the block of the Arab world, right? That the United States would tell the Israelis or the Saudis what to do. What this is, is that I don't want to use a, a really bad word about what Donald Trump is doing, but uh, he's a supplicant. He is not only just giving cover for Mohammed bin Salman and for, uh, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu, but he is their supplicant. He's their go-to boy. He's the one that is basically just saying, do whatever you want. And, and basically, you have Donald Trump being the PR representative uh, for Mohammed bin Salman, that's that's pretty disturbing. Well, even when you, I mean, since we're we have a couple of minutes to talk about this, but even when we started talking about the CIA, now they are walking this back, right? So they saw all these, even though they've admitted to the murder, they're walking back and they're attacking the CIA. CIA. So they have, and, but so they is have Trump. One of their princes going and saying, "Listen, the CIA was wrong about the <laughs> WMDs in Iraq. So how can how can you trust the CIA?" So they, so now, and, and of course, you know, Trump said, ah, that we're not so sure about this, these statements. So it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, how much more of a proof do you want? And, and in, to say that this was a, at least come out and say, we apologize. Uh, we're going to, uh, you know, send uh, Mohammed bin Salman to pasture, send him to Tunisia to a retirement home or something like this. That's where they have some property in Tunisia or right. in Morocco. 
And you hear rumors about this, but it doesn't seem to be uh, the way. Anyway, you are listening to Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. And we're going to be talking more about the story probably next week and the week after. Yeah, th and this is not a story that's going to go no, away. No, it's not going to go away. It's not a story that's going to go away. It's going to continue to cause problems for the United States both domestically because of uh, what it says about Donald, Tr Donald Trump and his, you know, just the way he's, he believes in the strategic kind of relationship. Uh, it's it's going to say a lot about uh, this kind of really destructive triumvirate, this uh, trilogy of, you know, really destructive uh, forces between the Israelis, the uh, the Saudis, and, uh, and Donald Trump. Right. But we have... There, other stories. There, we have talk. some other stories, yeah. Jamal. Yeah. Actually, there's a. I think there's a really interesting story coming out right now from, from you know Airbnb, which we should talk about. And uh, Airbnb came out with a rather significant uh, announcement this week, Jamal, which is causing the Israelis not just to freak out, but whatever is beyond freaking out, that Airbnb has decided to pull. It's uh, ads or it's uh, support it's for the listing, basically. Yes, uh, the listing ads of uh, from Israeli settlements. Well, illegal colonial settlements. Let's be clear. And they've about been this. I've, and they've been hearing uh, complaints uh, for I don't know how long. At least I don't know when Israel started to list apartments in Israeli colony. It's, I think at least it's been three years. Minimum three years. Minimum three yeah, years. Yeah, three years. So they've been hearing a lot of complaints and that these settlements are built on stolen uh, Palestinian land, including some of these homes that were appropriated and were right. stolen. Right. I mean, the owners of some of these homes... Are Palestinians. Are Palestinians. They've been seeing their homes illegally listed... Right. Under the person or the, the family, supposedly. The occupiers. That stole their home. And right. now they want to profiteer out of this. <laughs> and uh, Airbnb is uh, basically a vehicle to do that. So after those uh, thousands of complaints, they've decided and they've came up with a, a press uh, statement and saying that we, we don't want to... And I didn't like the way they... No, they, the statement they, they, wasn't they that statement good. I didn't like the statement. Because they talked about there is a long dispute. And it's not this, a long dispute. It's not a dispute. This is about stolen property. This is like any... Uh, whether eBay, you right. know. And eBay, you find a product on eBay that was, for stolen. example, stolen during World War II. They, you will, know, which they you, will come after they'll you. They'll come after you. Right. Or any kind of a stolen. So they, they, this is a clear-cut case where you have people who are living illegally on stolen property, profiteering, and Airbnb is helping to, helping them to do that. So, okay, I don't care about their statement. Their statement was kind of soft, but at least they put an end to this. So now they have been hit by a class action uh, lawsuit, or they're facing a class action lawsuit uh, over their the listing of these uh, settlement properties. Did you see the, uh, did you see the crying of the uh, settlers. Some of the comments from the settlers were unbelievable, Jamal. I, I, I know I, I kind of read them because the, the absolute disregard for their, their role in stealing these properties from Palestinians, from being an, for being on illegal territory, their illegal colonial settlements, and these poor settlers are coming saying they're being discriminated. We're being discriminated and against. And, and they're and, taking money and away and from also us. Also, they're now pushing it also towards anti Semitism. That's what they're claiming Airbnb so is. Yes, yeah. so that's what they're claiming. So so they're they're basically uh, bypassing that they are illegally there. They're bypassing the fact that in 1967 Israel occupied the West Bank. They're bypassing the fact that under the Fourth Geneva Convention, the transfer of population in an occupied territory is it's illegal. illegal. I mean, all of this and say, you're discriminating against us. Uh, we have to sue you. And they want to file actually a class action lawsuit in Israeli courts because they're saying that they've been discriminated, they're losing revenues, and, and so forth. By the way, Airbnb still lists uh, properties in 1948 or in historic right. Palestine, so they 
They didn't. No, they haven't delisted and anything. They still are listing properties in Jerusalem, including East Jerusalem. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, this is basically the West Bank, which includes mostly Area C. Okay. Jerusalem is. I thought is it included even, Jerusalem. No, it no, 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 no. It doesn't actually. Actually, this doesn't complete because you know they they haven't. Um, made a cut off point. They, they, in fact, they when people list something in Jerusalem, they, they don't put East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem. They just put Jerusalem. They put Jerusalem. So for them, they have to kind of like delist everything from Jerusalem, including West Jerusalem. So they pretty much uh, identified locations which are known to be within settlement enclaves. So if you have a house, let's say, in the old city, which was appropriated from a Palestinian family, and you list it, you'll find it. It's still, it's still on Airbnb. So their job is not totally yeah, finished. It's not finished. It's still, uh, you know, at least they've, they did the right thing in delisting the ones uh, that are in, in the settlements. But now, again, they have a, um, a suit lodged at the Jerusalem District Court, which accuses Airbnb of being part, and I'm quoting, of the long war being conducted by organizations and between bracket of which a clear majority are anti-Semitic. So against the state of Israel in its entirety and against Israelis living in settlements in particular. Well, this is part of the plan, Jamal. This is part of the plan that uh, you and I have been you know, talking about on Arab Talk for, for a long time now, which has to do... Anytime the Israelis are held accountable for their illegal, discriminatory, uh, colonial activities, and they get held accountable <coughs> to this in some way, they're held to account either by the International Criminal Court or they're held to account by, you know, economic means. They throw out the canard of their being, uh, whoever's doing this is being anti-Semitic. It's, it's the same thing that they've described with the uh, lawsuit against Professor Rabab Abdel Hadi, it's the same thing that they call out with the BDS movement. This is a big deal in many ways, Jamal, I think, because not as many people may fully appreciate or understand the BDS movement, but everybody knows about Airbnb. Everybody knows about Airbnb, everybody knows its uh, appeal, it's used all over the world, and for Airbnb to do something like this has got to be uh, not just, you know, a, a, a big deal politically, but it's sending shockwaves, I think, it, among Israelis. Yeah, and we have also to say that this wasn't just a call by Palestinians, this was an international call. That's right. So the pressure has been mounting on Airbnb on the international level, from Europe, uh, from human rights activists, from international human rights organizations, from, and so they've been getting a whole slew of emails complaints. and complaints and from the owners. And it took, like I said, at least three years. Right. This is three years in the making for them to kind of retreat and admit what they have been doing is wrong. Yeah. And what they've been doing because... You know, Airbnb is a, what is it, how many billion dollar company? Oh, oh it's a... It's a humongous. Yeah, it's... And so it's ten, not... It's, tens of billions it's of not dollars. A, it's not a fly-by-night organization no. or company. And sooner or later, and I believe in justice, it's going to take, you know, years. But eventually, justice... Will, will be served. Will be served. Yeah. And therefore, the longer Airbnb continues to violate international law and to profiteer, the bigger the payout they have to make. That's right. So at some point, when, let's say, assume that there is a, at some point, because that was the plan, this is, this is the failed Oslo, this is the whole idea behind Oslo, is that Palestinians will have their state and their state will include Area C. And this is, by the way, is recognized by the UN, by the United States. By the ICC. Which Airbnb is part of. Right. By the ICC, by the EU, by all international organizations that this territory, because when you talk about Resolution 242 and when you talk about even the Oslo Agreement, Area C 
where most of the settlements are illegal settlements are located, is going to eventually return to the Palestinians. 100%. So now you're violating this, and they violated this for, for basically now the past three years. If you continue this for another 10 years, think about the hundreds of millions of dollars that they are going to be liable. So I think they wanted also to save their behind, Yeah. and they did so. I think that's right, Jamal. Don't you think it's kind of ironic we have been, um, well, Palestinians have been speaking about the illegal occupation of their land for 70 years now and have been fighting in various political avenues or venues to try to make this wrong into a right and has, have, you know, been struggling for 70 years now to, to do something about the illegal occupation of historic Palestine. Isn't it interesting and just a tad bit ironic that it took something like the economic power of an Airbnb, of a, of, of, of a new tech company to finally hold at least a little bit modicum of uh, accountability to the Israelis? I mean, we're not talking about a lot, no. but it's the first chink in the armor, if you will. It's the first attempt... I think, by a large tech firm to kind of put itself out there and say, you know what, we're going to take a stand. The settlements are illegal. We're, not going, to we're going to delist these things. We're not going to create the context where illegal Israeli settlers are going to profit from stealing these Palestinian homes. I think it's kind of interesting. Where international law has failed, Jamal, we have this tech giant, Airbnb, actually doing something uh, to hold the Israelis accountable. It's kind of curious to me. Look, I was, uh, the other day, uh, a story came on my Twitter feed, and um, I was trying to actually look it up, but uh, I remember this was just like about a week ago, where you had a, uh, 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 recently a, um, a family member of a uh, Holocaust survivor uh, f found that there was a, uh, a, a art stolen right. by the Nazis, just like I don't know by by chance or somebody told them about it, but it belonged to their great grandfather, mm. and it it showed up, and now they're filing basically a, a case against both the art dealer and and of and the, it, it, from what I know from the story, that piece ended up in Switzerland, and the art dealer is trying to protect the identity of the buyer, but meanwhile they have a case because justifiably so, this is something that belonged to them. Why is it any different? For it's Palestinians, not. it's not to demand for things that had uh, that have been stolen from it, them. It's not any different, Jamal. That's and that's basically the point. And all we're really saying here is that, you know, this land was stolen. It's illegal under any kind of auspices of law and accountability that you have in the world right now. We need to hold the Israelis accountable, just like they're holding people who stole art from Jewish communities all over Europe, and when the Nazis stole it, they're held accountable. Why shouldn't the Israelis who stole Palestinian land be held accountable too? I just think it's ironic, right? It's Airbnb it I that's mean, doing I, it. I mean, I mean, and Airbnb basically is one, one little but, component of this but, whole equation. But, but, it's a big victory. It's that a they, huge victory, but... But, but there this, are other companies that right, actually that's my point. violate these laws and, well, why and, shouldn't we, and profiteer shouldn't we, out of the West Bank. But don't you think that this could potentially act as a model for how we can address other uh, failures of accountability of the illegal Israeli occupation? Maybe we can talk... Maybe we should address Uber. Maybe we need to address all of the tech. You know, the Israelis have lots of tech uh, incubators in the illegal uh, on stolen Palestinian land on these, on these settlements. Maybe we need to up the ante a little bit and go after these, these tech firms who are investing millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in these tech startups on the settlements. Well, I think this is the whole idea why Israel considers uh, the BDS movement 
an so existential yes, threat. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and which initially, by the way, they didn't, but now <laughs> it has become their main focus, and that's why with money from Haim Saban and Sheldon Adelson, they're not only fighting it there, but they're fighting it on college campuses in the United States, in Europe, because... It's starting to take hold. That's right. You know, I mean, when you talk about uh, just Airbnb on one side, and then you have cultural boycott, and then you have these artists who are refusing to perform in, uh, you know, in Israel because of its occupation, and then and then and you have academics also uh, who are boycotting. It takes a, a toll, and this is something that was practiced uh, during uh, the. Uh, apartheid period of South Africa. That's exactly and right. And it worked. And that's why they're freaking out But you know what, it. Jamal? It's starting to work now. It's starting to really... And yeah, but, they, uh, but they're fighting it. And they are using our their surrogates in the United States and our legal system to and violating, it. by the way, the Constitution to criminalize people who basically are practicing their First Amendment and saying, you know what? I'm not buying... I'm not going to buy products from a... From a settlement. I mean, what's wrong with that? If I can come and say, I don't want to buy whatever during uh, the period of South Africa, I'm not going to buy the uh, Afri gold from South Africa or diamonds from South Africa. And this is what uh, people were saying. It's the same, you know, it's the same parallel right. to what's going on now. And they know, even including a lot of, you know, I have to say, a lot of progressive Israelis and a lot of progressive uh, Jewish organizations, they're saying, yeah, you know, this is a peaceful solution. This is something like civil dis disobedience. And this is covered by your First Amendment rights. That's right. You're listening to Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. This is Arab Talk with Justin Jamal and... Uh, yeah, Jamal, you know, I I think that this is actually a much bigger deal than than we're even giving it credit for. And part of the reason why I think this is a big deal is by the nature of the response uh, from not only the, the colonizers, the illegal settlers in, in, in occupied Palestine, but you had Benjamin Netanyahu, you had uh, this whole cadre of surrogates come and say one of the first this was even reported on the mainstream media that the Israeli government is talking to the US government about what to do next about this. Well, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? Isn't isn't this whole thing based on economic principles of capitalism, Jamal, where you put your, you know, you let the market decide. And this is something that the market has decided that they do not want to continue to support, you know, this kind of activity. Uh, in 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 an open market, and that's how you get change. So the fact that the Israelis are so apoplectic about this, so enraged that they're already suing, I think you know. I actually think you know. We've talked about this. I actually think they're they're going to overplay their hand on this, as they always do. They're not winning the game no, anyway. That, but that's my point. They're going to push this and push this, and the only thing that's going to happen more people are going to become aware of this now. And that's fantastic news. Well, it's an organic movement. It's a movement that happened in the past. And this, by the way, boycott is part of the American culture. 100%. Uh, demonstration or demonstrating is part of the American culture. You know, no one can force you to purchase something that you don't want to purchase. This is the least thing that you can do right. when human rights are violated, when journalists are shot at, when children are getting killed, and when settlers are taking over people's land. I mean, it's what's more humanitarian, what's a more humanitarian act to do than basically say, you know what? I'm not going to give you my money. I'm not going to give you my money. I'm not going to support an entity which displaces people. Right which acts illegally, which acts brutally. And, you know, this is all occurring in the context, and you know, of, of, of the brutality that continues to go on in Gaza right now, Jamal, because we're approaching wintertime now in Gaza. Uh, the blockade of Gaza is getting much worse. 
um, it's going to get very cold. You know, the Israelis have stopped uh, uh, trucks that typically bring in the oil and the diesel to run the generator in Gaza. And unfortunately, Palestinians living in Gaza now are headed yet again for a very brutal, cold, and awful wintertime. And um, that's the story that we have to tell that is juxtaposed against the Airbnb story because really what this is ultimately about is about the fact that Israel continues to brutalize Palestinians in Gaza, in the West Bank, and, and in Jerusalem. So meanwhile, since we're talking about this, I want to later on talk about a story, actually a breaking story. But but, bef but before that, where that where this really puts the Trump Kushner peace plan. Yeah, let's talk about and, the Trump Kushner. And with, with the whole MBS <laughs> debacle. Yes. I mean, that's a soft way of describing it, a debacle. Yeah. And now we know the role of Saudi Arabia and how much Israel was dependent because now we're getting all these different leaks that basically the Trump plan, one of the pillars of the Trump plan was the Saudi Arabia accepting to... To secede basically Jerusalem to Israel. Right. That was kind of like now we know that when Trump made his stupid move, in my opinion, in moving the embassy there, he got the green light. Kushner got the green light from his buddy MBS. That right. was the first step. And the second step, uh, basically, what I'm reading in the Arab media and in the Israeli, Israeli media. That Saudi Arabia said, listen, you put your plan out there and we'll push for it. Yeah. And we will put Mahmoud Abbas <laughs> in a corner and force him to sign on it. Right. So so this is, you know, that's why it wasn't kind of like empty talk from Trump saying, right. you know, my, I'm coming with the deal of the century, the deal of... Because he actually did his deal of the century. He did. But his deal of the century was with his buddy, MBS, with Saudi Arabia. He figured... As long as I get the Saudis. I'm good. And why? And we have to talk about why. You know, the Palestinian Authority is in a very bad position now. They have lost their revenue, you know, the streams of their revenue. The United States is not giving them money. They're only receiving money from the EU, Saudi Arabia. Qatar has stopped sending money. Even right. the money that it was sending to Gaza is trickling now. Right. The money that they were getting from Turkey has stopped or kind of also dried, uh, up. dried up and others. So now they only have Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia still and the EU are the two major sources. There are other in the, in the, in the independent countries within Europe, like Britain gives money. Canada still gives money, but Canada gives money for security reasons right. mostly. And they're all allocated for different things. But the money that really pays... The employees, salaries, their uh, you know security, whatever. If Saudi Arabia tomorrow says, you know what, no more money, call us. Yeah, they they will collapse. It will collapse in a, in a second. So to cut a deal with the Saudis, that was actually the smart thing, and it was a very evil thing to do because it, really that was the deal of the century was basically to bring Mahmoud Abbas to his knees and force him in a position to accept everything that the Israelis or every, everything that Netanyahu was going to dictate to Jared Kushner to tell Donald Trump. I mean, this is how it works. Exactly. And now, since uh, MBS is in trouble, that's why they've delayed, actually, no, I think that's, talking about the deal. No, I think that's a good point, Jamal. And I think... You know, basically the, the deal of the century, the Kushner plan, the deal of the century, they have been delaying the announcement of this for three months now. And they keep saying it's coming, it's coming. But the reality is, is that it's not going to come because the MBS affair, the brutal assassination of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, the, the kind of collapse of this um, situation with the Saudis, Nothing is going to happen. There is no peace plan, Jamal. There and, is a peace plan, but it's, it's not, not. It's not a fair plan, and it will come out the minute they feel confident that I, that the pressure on MBS because of Khashoggi, or once they manage right. to kind of quell this fire, trust me, they will go back 
and put Mahmoud Abbas in a corner and say no money or you sign. Okay, you I know? have I have a prediction. You know, I'm pretty good at predictions. I think, and I could be completely wrong. I think that at this point in uh, Abu Mazen Mahmoud Abbas's life, he's ready to finally, as his last step toward his own sense of place in history, may not accept it. He may not accept it. Uh, yeah, and then there will be a collapse of the Palestinian Authority, which may not be such a bad thing for Palestinians. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at it the way how, trying to think how Benjamin Netanyahu uh, because at, at the end of the day, the deal of the century is what it's Benjamin Netanyahu, Netanyahu wants. wants. And he looks at it as, as, you know, as he has stated, that we now have the... Israel could not have had a better... Opportunity. ...president right. in the United <laughs> States than Donald Trump. <laughs> so this is his opportunity... And then they are not confident enough that Donald Trump is going to be a two-term president. Yes. So two years have passed. Now there are two, two more years. years. And this is the only time, you know, because look, Donald Trump, and, and actually it, it played perfectly for them. Donald Trump said that he will move the embassy, and he did. He moved it, yes. He moved it. Yeah. Every other president during their election campaign talked about this, and then when they came into power... They didn't move it. They didn't move it, but he acted on this. So now they feel that whatever we tell this guy, he's going to do it, and he's going to force the Palestinians... Uh, now, and I'm sure uh, Netanyahu had something to do with uh, not only moving the embassy, but also cutting all financial, cutting off all financial aid to the Palestinians. Right. So he did that. So now they're back, they're back to the corner, in, you know, against the wall. And then now they have two years to act because whatever they can get out of the... Two years is a long, long time. It is and it you isn't. Know, it you is know. and it isn't. And if they can extract... That signature from Mahmoud Abbas, you know, accepting a revised Oslo plan, which basically grants him, instead of 22% of the historic Palestine, which is the West Bank and Gaza, and only grants him something like 7% or 8%. Trust me, and because this is the plan, the plan of Israel, they are willing to give up Ramallah and, and the areas that Mahmoud Abbas controls, they don't care about Gaza. They don't care about it. They want to get rid of it. This is from the time of Sharon. Right. And forget about Area C. Area C, this is when we're talking about the settlement blocks. They will this just is where we're talking about the majority of the 800,000 settlers. They live there. Right. So if they get this, and they got already Jerusalem, as far as they're concerned. They don't care about anything else. That's what they're trying to achieve okay, in I, two years. Uh, yeah, and I think that's the, that's the direction that the Israelis want to go in right now. But the missing piece right now, frankly, is the mental state of Abu Mazen. We know he's, he's sick, but there's a little part of me that believes that he has these nightmares. He has this difficulty sleeping at night, knowing that his legacy could be the one that signs away uh, uh, dignity and the possibility of a Palestinian uh, legitimate recovery of their stolen land and the right of return. I think that what we're headed for most likely is a very different configuration of more uh, conflagration. I think that the possibility of another kind of eruption of uh, resistance is, is really possible in the next years. I don't know what you're thinking is. But this well, is a I very mean, fragile I'm, I'm, time. I've just actually told you what I think what Netanyahu wants. Doesn't yeah. mean that. But this what do is the what Palestinians want? Well, obviously the Palestinians don't want this, and the Palestinians don't trust Netanyahu, and actually, they don't trust Abu Mazen. Yeah, they, 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 a lot of them don't trust Abu Mazen, and uh, they don't trust the United States as a broker for sure. They don't trust they, the they, Saudis. They, they don't trust <laughs> Donald Trump. They don't trust the Saudis. So any any kind of thing could could happen. Uh, but definitely, I mean, the fear because the Palestinians, I mean, this is how they look at it from a legal point of view now, that the uh, P Palestinian Authority is the representative for the Palestinians. So if they get Abu Mazen to sign, 
or somebody else it doesn't have to be Abu Mazen because if something happens to Abu Mazen it could be somebody else and they there could is get someone to sign all up. kinds of nasty things because I'm watching things happening on the ground faking signature to sell land and properties of Jerusalem that's, that needs a whole topic to talk about it right so sadly we are witnessing a, a period of a lot of uh, dirty work happening uh, even people who are betraying uh, That's right. the cause. And so, and the, you know, at the end of the day, as far as the Palestinian Authority, it's in a very, very weak position. Yes. Listen, uh, you're listening to Arab Talk here on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. Jamal, we have a few minutes left, and I know you have some breaking news, which when I heard about this myself, I was absolutely blown away and shocked and it goes back to a a really dark period in time for Palestinians as you know 1982 happens to be one of the years in Palestinian history which is among the darkest periods of time because it was you know what happened in Beirut and Sabra and Shatila the massacres that occurred there but apparently there's some breaking news from the 1982 well it's a very important story it's been out a couple of days in the Israeli media now it's uh, been handled by uh, Arab media and of course Palestinian media it hasn't made its way right here but I think it's a very very important story so the Israeli media uh, and, and most recently Channel 10 which is a very prominent television channel in Israel uh, basically um, put a story about a major incident that happened in 1982 right after the ceasefire that happened right and uh, at the time this is when Yasser Arafat was pushed out uh, out of Lebanon and he went to Tunisia and after Sabra and Shatila and the whole war on Lebanon but so it was a peaceful period supposedly where you had now people leaving, because a lot of people didn't trust the uh, peace agreement, and a lot of Lebanese, a lot of uh, foreign nationals left the country, and they were leaving it uh, by air, by boats. And I remember, I, I remember that story, but I wasn't paying too much attention to it. But in 1982, just there was a Lebanese ship carrying like refugees and people who wanted right. to to flee. And they left, and all of a sudden, it, the way it was reported, had an explosion, and it sank. And killed everybody. And Well, no, it didn't kill everybody. It killed 25 people. Mm. Other Others were rescued. Uh. It, I think it was carrying something like 57. 25 died. The captain of the ship died. The boat sank, and that story disappeared. So now... The story is back. What happened, news, Jamal? And with an admittance and with proof that an Israeli submarine... Oh, my God. ...torpedoed the boat. So they targeted the boat. They targeted the boat, a boat full of civilians, a boat of people uh, escaping uh, the country. And they deny. Of course, they not they didn't. They didn't. They pretended nothing ha has. So that's why there was the confusion. What happened? Why did it explode? Nobody knew what happened to that except that boat exploded and killed twenty five people. And and uh, boats were rescuing those who jumped in the in the water. And so, according to Channel Ten, uh, 10 who actually which had filed a petition to the High Court of Justice in Israel against the censorship, and they got the report on the incident. They got all the information and they identified the captain of the submarine and they identified the submarine, the Israeli submarine. Of course, they refer to the captain as Major uh, A. Uh, they hide his identity. And now they admitted and the captain said at the time he thought that the boat was carrying Palestinian fighters, according, fleeing from the IDF. And he ordered to fire two torpedoes. Unbelievable. Two torpedoes in the Mediterranean, singing a civilian, a civilian, uh, civilian boat uh, was full of children. Ch children died, women, elderly, not only Lebanese, not Palestinians, but also they had some foreign nationals. This is a story developing, so I don't have all the names. But there might it, be but, other countries but, now. But isn't involved. this a, isn't this a war crime, Jamal? It Patel? is, and that's the thing. 
So now, you know, I mean, that's the question. Imagine if this happened to by any other uh, power or no, any other be, country. It would be a war crime. And uh, the Lebanese boat, by the way, was heading to Cyprus, which is a very short distance from, from Lebanon. And the story was kind of like swept under the rug. Now we have the evidence, uh, and they've had actually a former Israeli uh, officer who was on television and listened to the interview. His name is is retired now, Colonel Mike Elder, and he was the who well, he was the commander of the 11th Flotilla for Israel during during the war. And he he's um, kind of like spilling the beans, saying we have rules of engagement, even on submarines. You don't just shoot a boat because you suspect maybe there was something. And he's calling for an investigation. No, now so again, it, this falls in the gray area to me. Anytime I hear about Israel investigating itself, you know what? Yeah, the outcome. Right. There's no. But really, what this says, Jamal, is that uh, the Israelis, you know. Uh, were caught up in yet another war crime and firing using a military vessel, uh, a submarine, an Israeli submarine, which, by the way, they got from the Germans, you know, which, you know, that's where Israel has always gotten its submarines from, from Germany, that the Israelis fired two torpedoes on a, basically a ship of people trying to flee uh, a war. They were refugees or asylum seekers trying to save themselves and uh, were shot uh, by by an Israeli military uh, uh, submarine. This is clearly a war crime. So, so here is the question. Is this going to be another story where it gets brushed under the yes. rug? Uh, is this another story yes. where they will get, get brushed like under the a slap on the wrist? Yes. Uh, did, and there are many questions. Did uh, the because the Americans were very much involved in uh, brokering, you know, the agreement. They must have known about it. The Americans with their satellites. They must have known and about it. And uh, the CIA and everything. I mean, remember the big story about Israel also attacking uh, during ni- 1967. That's right. That's right. A US, U.S. ship. USS Liberty. Right. Right. And killing everyone and then, oh, yeah, it's a mistake and that's it. I mean, I know, uh, I hear and I, I read always posts from family members of those sailors who that's right. got killed and they've, uh, I don't know if they received compensation or an official apology. No, they haven't. Like there this. has been no official apology for this yet. And the ship was flying the, the U.S. flag and now you have this Lebanese civilian boat. And so who else knows about it? I mean, to me, I feel it's not just Israel. Uh, to me, there are other agencies and other players, whether European countries, whether the United States, because Absolutely. there is shared intelligence amongst them. And then once they found out that civilians died and they just kept silent about it, they are just as guilty. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this is a story, Jamal, that we're going to be covering for a long time. Um, If what you're saying is true, and it is, uh, based on what we've been able to find out so far, this is uh, yet another war crime that the Israelis uh, have perpetrated, and uh, it's it's actually very sad. Hey, listen, we've come to another uh, end here of uh, Arab Talk with Justin Jamal. You need to send us your comments to Arab Talk at uh, kpoo.com. Watch us uh, on SoundCloud, on Facebook, on YouTube. And what about our website, Jamal? We have our website too, Arab, Arab Talk, Talk Radio. ArabTalkRadio.com. You can sign up to your favorite streaming so, service. Right, and check right us there. out. We'll see you next week then. Thanks for joining us today. See you next week. <laughs>